Good morning and welcome to Walnut United Methodist Church. Thank you for being part of our worshiping community today. You might figure out that we are having a different kind of service today. We are blessed by our um, wonderful lay speaker today, uh, Carol Coy. She will be delivering the message today. And so I get to play your liturgist today from my office at home. Uh, a few announcements before we get going, and that is uh, tomorrow, Monday, is our preschool board meeting, uh, the March 15th at 7 p.m., so make sure you're uh, on Zoom at 7 p.m. I also wanted to um, announce and um, uh, invite you to be a part of our, um, our one-year anniversary of COVID service, which will be next Sunday. Uh, I have invited you and your families and uh, your children to make a small video, a short video that details how and details and describes how you've changed in the last year, what you've learned, uh, what you've lost, what, what you have uh, gained, so if you are interested in making a video, uh, let me know. And those are due on Wednesday, March 18th. Also, uh, Wednesday, March 18th, uh, we will be having a um, SPRC meeting uh, at noon on Zoom. So make sure you're there. And then later on that day at 2 o'clock, um, we will be having Telma Andrews Graveside service um, at Forest Lawn in Covina Hills and uh, it's outdoors. If you do choose to come please um, wear a mask and abide by social distancing and uh, we will honor Telma's life at that point. We will also have a memorial service at the church um, when things open up a little bit more so that we can be there and uh, tell stories and uh, be together in honoring and celebrating Telma's life. Also on Saturday, we have our youth pizza party. So Saturday at noon. Otherwise, it's a really slow week. <laughs> so let us join together in our worship service today. Please join me in the call to worship. Look around at this wondrous world. God's mighty acts in creation are magnificent. Come, let us offer praise and prayer to God. Let us celebrate all God's goodness, for even in the midst of the horrible storm, God is with us. Amen.
Let us pray our opening prayer. Lord of diversity and union, we call upon you this day to open our hearts to your love, our ears to your words, our eyes to see the needs of those both near and far, and our spirits to do your will. Be with us and give us courage and inspiration for the future of your world, O Lord. Amen. Let us pray together. Oh God, we pray for all of our brothers and sisters around the world who have been affected by the coronavirus. For those who've tested positive, those awaiting results, family members and friends of those affected and those who have died. We pray for all of those in the medical field, doctors and nurses, staff, janitorial services, food services, all those who work in hospitals and doctor's offices and urgent cares and care facilities for the elderly, rehabilitation centers, and those in care homes for vulnerable adults. We pray for our essential workers and all who are on duty for us. We pray for all of those who have lost jobs in this crisis for all who have been furloughed and laid off. We pray for the small businesses who've closed their doors. We pray for those who are looking for new opportunities, open doors for them and help them to persevere. We pray for our teachers and our parents and our children as the school year continues to present challenges both in online school, in hybrid school, in in-person school. We pray for all of those who are going back into class for their safety and protection. We pray for those who are living and working communally, for those living and working in our prison system, for those who live in college dorms, for those who work in close quarters and are vulnerable to infection. We pray for those with addictions and anxiety and depression, mental health issues, and all of us as we experience grief and anger and frustration. We especially pray for our young people as they navigate this treacherous time. Help us to survive each day and the next and the next until we are able to feel better, more hopeful and more like ourselves. O oh Lord, we pray for peace and justice in our land. We pray for the halt of violence against our Asian American brothers and sisters. And we pray for the dismantling of systemic racism in our country. We pray that we are able to see one another as you see us, one human family in this world. We give you thanks for the scientists who have worked to develop the vaccines, all of those who are administering them 
and all of the people receiving their, receiving their vaccinations. Lord, we thank you for the miracle of science and for the people who are helping us move past, move beyond into the next phase of healing and progress. Lord, we lift up for into your care the young girl who was involved in the police pursuit in Walnut this week and all of those who were involved in such a traumatic event, be with them. Give them healing and comfort, Lord. We pray for Pat upon the passing of her brother. And we pray for all of those who grieve his loss and celebrate his life. We pray for Judy as she continues to heal. We pray for Nellie as she prepares for a mass to be biopsied. We pray for Carol who is home and Ace who is caring for her. Be with them, Lord. We continue to pray for the Peeler family and the Chamley family and for Marilyn and Dawn's niece, Dusty. We pray for answered prayers from Luvi that her lab work was all in the normal range. We pray for Damien's friend's son who was rushed to the children's hospital with a fever and pain. Jen asked for prayers for Fred's cousin, Patty, who was in a coma from a bleeding problem the bleeding stopped and she was able to call her sister today. Continued prayers for her healing. For Jen's cousin, Brenda, who has lupus, be with her Lord. Jen lifts up a joy for Julie, who is doing okay after her radiation treatments, who has a long recovery and we pray for Julie and Lori's dad, who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and has a hernia that needs surgery. Prayers for the whole, deci the whole family as decisions are made. We lift up Jen's friend, Sharon, and we lift up a joy that Ed is doing well and is out of the hospital and his Bell's palsy is slowly re resolving. We pray for Fred's dad, Alfred, who is recovering from his heart surgery. We pray for Vern, who was in the hospital last week, who has insomnia and dehydrated. He is on the men now, walking and talking and getting back to his normal self. Prayers for his continued progress and prayers for Jen. We pray for all of those who are caregiving for their beloved family members. We pray for Kelly as she recovers from surgery and Bill as he is grateful for a smooth surgery this week. Prayers for recovery and healing. And we pray for those who are making big life decisions about how to continue in the wake of broken relationships, the end of work, retirement and new opportunities. And we pray for the staff and patients at Potter Hospital in India, as well as those who are experiencing medical crises and financial challenges and all who are worried and stressed and fearful as we have offered names of people and situations which have been heavy on our hearts, O Lord, remind us also that we stand in the need of that same healing love. As we have prayed for ministries of peace and justice and for those engaged in those missions, remind us that we are also on a journey of peace and justice whenever we offer comfort and aid to others. 
Be with us during this Lenten season. Give us hearts of great joy and courage to serve you all of our days. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, as he taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson today is from Matthew 6 verses 25 through 33. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and is tomorrow thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Here ends the reading of the word. Thanks be to God.
Good morning. Welcome. What would our world be like without bird song? Join me for a walk through some of the birds of the Bible with a few surprises along the way. Now, some of you may remember from my lay message last year that I shared their two big passions in my life, birds and photography. And well, truth be told, birds are more of an obsession since fourth grade project. In our current world, bird watching and birding, where you probably own a field guide or two and an app, and you actually travel to see birds, it's incredibly popular. How many people do you think seriously notice and watch the birds around their homes or when walking through their neighborhoods? So in a throwback to the good old days of in-person worship, this is the point where Pastor Krista would ask a question, she'd pause and say something on the order of, okay, this is the place in the service where you all get to participate. So think about it. Just how popular do you think bird watching is today? Well, you may be surprised to know that according to the most recent U.S. Fish and Wildlife report, there are over 45 million bird watchers age 16 and up in the United States. That's over 20% of our population. And over 57 million people participate in feeding birds in their backyard gardens. Want to buy stock in bird seed? And it's not just in the United States. There is global interest in birds. In the UK, bird watching has even overtaken fishing as the most popular hobby. And in less developed realms, it's often recognized that local efforts to preserve critical habitat and local birds also helps provide new sustainable jobs as birding travelers bring much needed income to many communities. Now, since the pandemic, though, the interest in birds has grown even larger as evidenced by internet visits. In just the first two months of the pandemic, March and April last year, Audubon website visits were up 23%, and their Facebook group more than doubled. American Birding Association podcasts went up from 5,000 to 8,000 views per week. And speaking of Audubon, I want to thank our local Pomona Valley Audubon Society president, Tina Stoner, for sharing her great Meadowlark video that we opened with this morning. So all of this is just to set the stage. As we notice and appreciate birds today, so did people throughout history. Birds have been depicted symbolically in art, in music, and dance. They appear in many cultures, mythology, and religions. They've been hunted, captured, and bred for food and their feathers. They've been prized in falconry and kept for their song. Birds can bring us joy. It's thought that the closer a people live to their land, the more they're aware of the birds there. This played out in the pandemic as we spent more time at home in our yards and on walks through the neighborhoods and so it was in biblical times. For this message, I thought it would be interesting to look into the role and occurrence of birds in the Bible, and boy, did I bite off more than I can chew. Birds appear in around 300 verses of the Bible in both literal and metaphorical usage. They appear from the creation stories in Genesis to the symbolic end of war in Revelation. Although the Old Testament contains most of the bird references, the New Testament bird stories provide encouraging messages of hope and comfort. Most references are generally to birds or fowl, but several specific birds play key starring roles, mainly doves, ravens, sparrows, quail, and eagles. And we'll focus on those in a moment. The most species-specific account of birds is found in the listings of the thou shalt not eat birds, the unclean birds of Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14. Using Leviticus 11 verses 13 to 19 as the example, since Deuteronomy verses are very similar, they just add a species. 
It reads, These you shall regard as detestable among the birds. They shall not be eaten. They are an abomination. The eagle, the vulture, the osprey, the buzzard, the kite of any kind, every raven of any kind, the ostrich, the nighthawk, the seagull, the hawk of any kind, the little owl, the cormorant, the great owl, the water hen, the desert owl, the carrion owl, the vulture, the stork, the heron of any kind, the hoopoe, and the bat. A look at the lists of these 20 birds and the bat, well, it does fly, and it wasn't yet known to be a mammal. Immediately, it illuminates the challenges of translating rarely used Hebrew names. A study evaluated the English translations of these 20 birds in just four English Bible versions, and that resulted in 40 separate birds. One Hebrew name is translated both as the ostrich in one version and the desert owl in another. Similarly, one name is translated to the pelican in some versions and the horned owl in others. And there are other examples where these birds cannot possibly be confused in real life. A swan is certainly different than an owl. It's just all in translation. Clearly, this is ripe for a thesis topic. Regardless of the naming problem, though, these unclean birds share several commonalities. They are all either birds of prey, water birds, or scavengers. But although they are all carnivores, not all the insect eaters are on the list. Some scholars have actually created a list of six anatomical characteristics that separate them. It gets really complicated and looks again like the stuff of another thesis. But remember, ravens and eagles are on this unclean list. And the intent was to simply remove them from the menu. So we will leave these unclean birds for a moment and move on to the purity of the dove. Before God created every winged bird of every kind and blessed them to be fruitful and to multiply on the earth, the rabbinic writers of the Talmud suggest that at the beginning of creation, God hovered over the face of the water with the additional detail, like a dove, in Genesis 1, verse 2. The dove, now already making an appearance in the very second verse of the Bible, then appears around 50 more times. Not only as an inexpensive creature of sacrifice, but also as a symbol of peace, of love and beauty, of fidelity, of the nation of Israel, and of course, the Spirit of God. In Genesis 8, Noah released a dove to survey the receding waters. Then he sent out the dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set its foot and it returned to him to the ark, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took it and brought it back into the ark with him. He waited another seven days and again sent out the dove from the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening and there in its beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent out the dove, and it did not return to him anymore. Unlike the Jewish tradition, in St. Jerome's fourth century Latin translation, the dove's return with that leaf of olive became the branch of olive, and thus established this Christian symbol of peace. In the Song of Solomon and the Psalms, the dove appears to be a metaphor for innocence, beauty, and love, and their voices are an indication of spring and new life. We know that biblical writers observe the behavior and the coming and going of the birds. For example, they describe the turtle dove as a migratory bird in Jeremiah 8, 7. Even the stork in the heavens knows its time, and the turtle dove, swallow, and crane observe the time of their coming. 
In the New Testament, we know from Luke 2.24 that a pair of turtle doves or young pigeons accompanied Jesus on his first trip to the temple where his parents presented him to the Lord as their firstborn male child along with their bird sacrifice. And each of the four gospels describes the dove upon the occasion of Jesus' baptism. Luke writes, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. Matthew writes very similarly, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. The Spirit visualized as a dove embodied both gentleness and sim symbolized the sacrificial nature in the culture of the times. Although with some thanks to Christian art, we probably all picture the symbol as a beautiful, pure white dove. Newsflash! These doves were all likely to be the abundant rock dove. Gray, with iridescent necks of green and purple common throughout the Holy Land in biblical times. Yes, folks, the pigeon. The spiritual event was described using a symbol of everyday image. Pigeons nested in the crevices of the cliffs and homes everywhere and were known to be intelligent and caring parents as they demonstrated fidelity to their mates, like our mourning doves are known for today. Centuries actually passed before the white dove became a symbol of the Christian church and more particularly the Holy Spirit of God at work in the world. And today, pigeons... Frankly, they just get a bad rap. Speaking of bad reputations, let's turn to that unclean raven and its many dual roles, often maligned as a scavenger. But they weren't all bad. Do you remember that before the dove, Noah sent out a raven to investigate? It circled the ark until the land was exposed then the dove was released. And in 1 Kings 17, the ravens dutifully fed Elijah morning and evening as he hid in the wilderness. One of the most well-known bird passages in the Bible is Jesus' do not worry message found in Matthew 6. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your span of life? Luke, on the other hand, in chapter 12, writes instead more specifically, Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn. And yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? This echoes Psalm 147.9 and Job 38.41, where God told Job that he fed the ravens as evidence of his care for creation. The use of the raven in these texts is interpreted by scholars as underlining the important message that God cares for all, that creation is not divided into good and bad, clean and unclean. The sparrow is used similarly in Bible texts to reassure us of his precious care of us all as individuals. In Matthew 10, 29 to 31, Jesus asks, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs on your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Jesus' words are also recounted in Luke 12, 6. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten in God's sight. Turning from the sparrow to the eagle, we see strength, protection, sovereignty, and even the image of God projected onto this majestic yet unclean bird throughout the Bible. 
God is an eagle carrying the Israelites on her wings, as well as the protector under whose feathers we will find refuge. Psalm 91 depicts God as this protector. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. Believers are related to the eagle in Isaiah 40, 31, where it's written that those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. In addition to the symbolism so often placed on birds, the Old Testament also contains a number of biologically interesting observations. Natural circumstances are also reflected in many of these bird-related passages of the Old Testament. The dual quail narratives of Exodus 16 and Numbers 11 are just such examples. As with the spring migration of our North American breeding birds from their wintering in South America, many fly over the Gulf of Mexico and fall out exhausted when they reach the shores of the Texas and the Louisiana coasts. Likewise, in the Holy Lands, Quail migrate from Europe and the Middle East and Africa over portions of the Mediterranean and Red Seas. Depending on their path and the weather conditions, they arrive on Palestinian shores exhausted and even today are netted along the Gaza Strip by families for food and by hunters for market. The common quail can't fly long distances at a time, and so they try to fly with the wind and need many rest stops along the way. The Israelites would have been very familiar with them in Egypt before the Exodus. Scholars believe the first quail event occurred on the southwest side of the Sinai Peninsula in late April on the quail's northward migration out of Africa about six weeks after the Israelites left Egypt. In Exodus 16, 11, 13, it is written, the Lord spoke to Moses and said, I've heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, the quails came up and covered the camp and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. In the second event reflected in Numbers 11, 31 and 32, approximately a year later on the northeast of the peninsula, the Israelites were complaining about the monotony of the food in the desert. It's written, then a wind went out from the Lord and it brought quails from the sea and let them fall beside the camp. About a day's journey on this side and a day's journey on the other side, all around the camp, about two cubits deep on the ground. So the people worked all day and night and all the next day gathering the quails. The least anyone gathered was ten homers, and they spread them out for themselves all around the camp. Now there's a lot of academic discussion and dispute over the numbers of quail and indeed even the number of the population traveling. But since an omer is considered the load which can be carried by a donkey, and according to the scholar Jay Wilkinson, is the largest measure found in the Old Testament, it was a very large number of birds. Just imagine a minimum of 10 donkey loads per person. No matter what the true numbers, scripture is clear. This was a miraculous feast of the common quail. Now lastly, in Job, there are an impressive collection of very species-specific bird commentary. Let's look at a quick three examples. Job, in his despair, observes his days as slipping by like eagles swooping down on their prey where he's likely alluding that cruel justice may be viewed as the eagle and Job as its prey. In addition, one of literature's most ancient references to migration is found in one of God's last questions to Job in 3926. Does the hawk take flight by your wisdom and spread its wings toward the south? 
Surely the author is familiar with eagle hunting behavior and has seen the amazing sight of the several species of hawks that migrate through the Middle East. Job 39, 13 to 18 presents a detailed comment on the life of the ground nesting flightless ostrich, where it's kind of helpful if we understand multiple hens actually may lay eggs in a common nest and some may seem indifferent to another's chick. The wings of the ostrich flap joyfully, but they cannot compare with the pinions and feathers of the stork. She lays her eggs on the ground and lets them warm in the sand, unmindful that a foot may crush them and that some wild animals may trample them. She treats her young harshly as if they were not hers. She cares not that her labor was in vain, for God did not endow her with wisdom or give her a share of good sense. Yet when she spreads her feathers to run, she laughs at horse and rider. Yes, indeed, the ostrich does get the last laugh. In all these writings, we see the authors recount stories employing common images of everyday life that they expect will resonate with their readers. Birds were employed in just such a manner, and their symbolism is universal and has stood the test of time. Job suggests that surely God has provided the wisdom seen in the animals and birds. But ask the animals and they will teach you, and the birds of the air and they will tell you. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? As Paul reminds us in Romans 15, 4, the Bible was written for us. For whatever was written in former days was written for our learning, that we, through patient and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. I believe the birds of the Bible have been employed to effectively convey that exact message. May we all hear it and believe. Amen. Go now into the world to be the people of God. And may God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and go with you always. Amen.